Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum dear participants. Uh, welcome to this session of uh, moral lessons from the Quran. Uh, the passage that we have selected today is in continuation with the previous uh, day's passage which is from Surah Shura. And uh, if, you remember, if you would remember for those of you who were present last night that uh, this, the attributes that we discussed yesterday which are mentioned in Surah Shura relate to some of the individual and collective uh, responsibilities. The uh, passage which is going to be discussed today is from verses 39 to 43 of the same surah. I'm going to read out the text and translation before you. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْبَغْيُ هُمْ يَنْتَصِرُونَ وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا فَمَنْ عَفَا وَأَسْلَحَا فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ ولمن انتصر بعد ظلمه فأولئك ما عليهم من سبيل إنما السبيل على الذين يظلمون الناس ويبغون في الأرض بغير الحق أولئك لهم عذاب أليم ولمن صبر وغفر إن ذلك لمن عزم الأمور And those who take revenge only when excess is committed against them and the reward of a sin is an act equal to it but he who forgave and made amends, then his reward rests with God. God does not like the wrongdoers. And those who take revenge after being wronged incur no blame. Blame is on those who are unjust and are rebellious in the land without any right. It is these people for whom there is a woeful torment. And he who showed patience and forgave, then this is indeed from among lofty traits. So this passage, as you can see, clearly has a single one-point message, uh, and it is very loud and clear. And that is as far as uh, people who experience wrong being committed against them uh, are concerned, they can, of course, uh, retaliate in equal measure. They can uh, take revenge. But the Quran says that, وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَزْبِ الْأُمُورِ If they are able to exercise patience, and forgive the person who has wronged them, who has inflicted harm on them. And this is something of an outstanding trait. And this is something which is really, really commendable in the eyes of God. So, of course, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is like a situation in which, uh, you see, we have several, we have two basic, uh, I would say, human dispositions. One of these dispositions is that a person, if he has been, treated unjustly, if he has, he has been treated wrongly, he or she would write, uh, like to uh, retaliate that hurt. And the Quran actually gives that person the right to do so by telling him or her that, yes, you can retaliate in, in, in equal terms, but a higher form of, uh, of, uh, of being benevolent is that you forgive that person and you forgo that person. And the beautiful thing here is the, the Quran says that for Ajruhu Allah, in case you forgive that person, then don't forget the, the biggest glad tiding that, that you can hear is that your reward will be from God. Of course, the implication here is that he is going to reward you manifold, something which is even beyond our imagination. So, of course, we can. Uh, retaliate in equal measure. We have been given this chance because you see, at times the hurt caused is so much that if you don't uh, retaliate or you don't uh, pay back in the same way, you are not appeased. And as a result, we find uh, things going out of proportion. So in the times of uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and even before him, uh, the tribe were always at war and the war would uh, often occur on a very small happening and then the retaliation would be of 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 several multitudes i mean it would be like of multiple uh, if it would be if someone has caused a degree of harm which could be called as one unit in nature he would or she would be re retaliated with something 10 times or maybe 100 times severer so this would cause a lot of warfare a lot of bloodshed and uh, and this would continue for several decades, uh, even uh, centuries at times. And we know that this has been happening all over, uh, uh, all over the world as well. So even in, in the legal terms, the Quran has told us that if, uh, if you have been wrong, if someone has injured you or wounded you or even killed any of your heirs, then you have the chance to retaliate in equal coins. But if you forgive, then that is something which is uh, 
a great uh, greatly rewarding so we have both these uh, options available but the recommended option as you can clearly see once again from these quranic verses is that if you inflict the same amount of uh, harm to the other person then this is something which cannot be uh, uh, i mean regarded as blameworthy so the quran says fa ulaika ma alayhim min sabil which means that they, if they revenge if they take revenge then this will not incur any blame on them actual blame will be on the person who are unjust and rebellious in the na in namas sabilu ala allazina yazlimun an nas wa yabghuna fil ard bi ghair al haq they show rebellion without any justification and it is said that ulaika lahum azabun alim that it is for such people for whom there is a woeful there is a woeful torment of course referring to the fact that in the hereafter they would be receiving or they would be giving given a very severe punishment so uh, dear my dear viewers uh, this is something of a ordeal that we often face because uh, one of the things that often bothers us is that uh, when we have been wrong in a severe way if we have been harmed in a severe way if uh, people mock at us if they make fun of us if they divide us it's extremely difficult to to forgive such people but you see uh, this is what god wants us to do that if we can forgive them if we are able to forgive them and this is one of the most noblest gestures that we can do and the forgiveness uh, uh, the or the trait of forgiveness uh, if you can call it is such that this can only be gained if we have a very strong connection with god because you see uh, this forgiveness the inspiration for this forgiveness i would say comes from god because it is he who has promised us uh, a reward of many fold and uh, if we are able to have that strong god connection then we have that uh, inner strength in us to forgive people uh, forgiveness is not a sign of weakness at all uh, there are there, at times we do think that well it is a sign of weakness and people would say that well look at this person he could not even uh, protect himself or herself this is not the case uh, forgiveness is something which requires a lot of courage it is a it's something which is like controlling uh, that inner urge in you to talk back to a person whom you were just justifiably uh, given the uh, the right to talk back in 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 uh, harsh terms or to retaliate in harsh terms so it needs a lot of patience it needs a lot of uh, self uh, discipline and there is nothing better uh, for this self discipline for uh, in us to be in inculcated than this beautiful month of ramadan the patience we learn the perseverance we learn how we control ourselves uh, all of us know when we are passing through a fast particularly when it's a very hot day or we are exposed to the elements of nature uh the amount of uh, restraint that we have to exercise is is quite a lot and therefore we can clearly see how this month actually inculcates this patience in us and precisely for this reason prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would fast in other months as well so the month of ramadan for him would be a month of patience a month of perseverance which of course is what the quran says when it uh, refers to it to the by the words allakum tattaqun the so taqwa is 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 the result of that patience yes taqwa means to remain in your limits to not exceed limits and this can only happen if we have that patience in ourselves so prophet muhammad always uh, we are told by by his beloved wife aisha that he would fast for three optional three he would fast three optional days uh, in other months of ramadan as well and the and they would be at times the 13th 14th and 15th of each lunar month and at times it would be different and this is just to emphasize the point that uh, just as we have optional prayers we pray nawafil similarly the these nawaf these nafil fasts or these optional fasts uh, they not only uh, of course have their own benefits but they also are able to instill in us this uh, a tremendous quality which is the quality of patience and do remember the fact that the quran has iterated at a number of instances especially Uh, in surah dahar it says the jazahum bima sabaru jannatan wa harira that it is basically this this patience uh, which is going to reward a person with the life of paradise because you exercise control for the sake of god so in order to forgive people as this verse has uh, said in on in a very beautiful way and it has inspired us in a way that god is going to give us give us the reward of uh, showing forgiveness then uh, we have to have that patience 
also important my dear uh, participant is the fact that uh, we of we are very weak people we are uh, we have this habit of exceeding the limits at times and we do cross the limits it's in spite of trying to restrain ourselves so uh, so how many a time we do so and uh, we keep asking for forgiveness from the almighty and such is the proclivity of the almighty that he has said that he it is as if he is waiting for a person to ask for forgiveness and he is someone who would like to forgive the person who has made amends and also felt sorry and uh, and and done the needful and uh, on one occasion he has said that people who commit sins in frenzy and then immediately ask for forgiveness it is incumbent the words are it is mandatory upon him he says that is mandatory upon me to forgive such a person so you see this is what the Uh, what the almighty himself is like he is prone to forgiveness he likes to forgive people uh, and to him it is not the sin which counts as much as the attitude one adopts after one sin so on a similar in a similar vein on on similar grounds we ourselves should uh, take the cue and also as we often discuss that all these qualities and all these attributes which are mentioned in the uh, in the quran they are not just mentioned to uh, introduce the almighty they are mentioned so that we in our own capacity try to adopt those attributes so if god is merciful he is compassionate he is kind of course uh, we just cannot match in any way his compassion his mercy his forgiveness but the reason that these attributes are mentioned are that we have to try and be our best to adopt a small portion as much as we can and forgiveness which is of course mentioned in the quran as in in various ways as the attribute of the of god like ghaffar like ghafur like rahim like rahman so all these words signify mercy and forgiveness in one sense or or the other and we come across these attributes every now and then in the quran and it is it is the best lesson that we can draw from these attributes that we have to be we have to learn to be a person who is forgiving learn to be a person who is willing to forgo and if ever there is a need that we have to take revenge or take uh, i mean retaliate in any way because there are instances then it should not and uh, never exceed the amount of harm that has been in, uh, afflicted on us because this would be outright injustice so there is an idea which has been set by the quran and then there is a as a step below that it is just like what the quran has alluded to at other instances by the terms of uh, of adl and ihsan justice and and goodness so justice is to treat someone equally uh, in a way that is commensurate with the with the norms of fairness and ihsan or something which is of the nature of goodness would mean that you are a step ahead and you would like to go ahead and not only treat that person justly but in such a magnanimous way in such a uh in such a way that the other person feels that he or she has been done a great favor so let us learn from these attributes of the almighty and let us try uh, to uh, make our lives uh, as much as much uh, i would say uh, forgiving as is possible for others we have to learn to forgive in order to be forgiven and forgiveness is a trait that uh, if you if we are able to inculcate in us uh, through patience and through our connection with god uh, believe me you'll feel a very light hearted person it makes you a person who is at peace with himself or herself when we are in rage when we are in frenzy when we are angry we are i mean it's the biggest harm that we are doing to our own selves when we are forgiving when we have this quality of forgiveness in our ourselves uh, you'll find that we are at peace with ourselves it, it would be as if we we would have uh elevated ourselves and uh, tried our best to come as close to god as possible so with these words i end my talk today on uh, on these verses and i'm now available for your questions thank you dr shahzad uh before we reach out to the raised hands i have a written question uh, in prayer we praise allah ask him uh, for his mercy and seek his help and ask for his forgiveness But why do we recite Surah Lahab in prayer as it is dedicated to cursing of Abu Lahab and his wife? Why do we need to recite this surah in prayer? What benefits will we get from this surah if we recite it? That's the question. So, 
First of all, uh, the translation of the surah is often wrongly done, which makes uh, us uh, this, uh, which gives us this impression that we are cursing Abu Lahab. So the words "tabat yada Abu Lahab they are not words of curse at all. Uh, in Arabic, when you say "tabal lak," which means uh, curse, curse on you, is something which actually means cursing someone. But when we say "tabat yada Abu Lahab," which means the the hands of uh, Abu Lahab, uh, they are broken. This is actually referring to it is like a metaphorical expression which refer which refers to the fact that the power of Abu Lahab is uh, now stands decimated and destroyed. He was the greatest enemy of uh, God. He uh, was the one who instilled a lot of enmity amongst the Quraysh against the Prophet, and he was the one who died a very uh, bitter death. So uh, it was not in response to any curse as is generally understood. And I've, uh, I, th I think I've lectured on this topic as well elsewhere or written somewhere on it as well. And uh, the, the person can consult that in detail. But uh, it is a gross uh, misinterpretation to think that this is, these are words of curse. They are actually a, they are actually words of prediction because this is a Meccan surah. And Abu Lahab was the, uh, was the chief of the Quraysh and he was to be crowned king had the Prophet not come. And he was uh, challenged the most by the Prophet. He thought that his own superiority was at stake. And so uh, his, it was uh, his power and, and his uh, strength that was uh, pitted against the, uh, against the Muslims. So uh, in the Meccan Surah, the Prophet is being assured that don't worry that the way uh, he, they are challenging you and the way that they are uh, uh, pitted against you and uh, doing all sorts of things to undermine your mission they are not going to stay there forever and they are going to meet their fate so it's basically an expression of telling us that he is going to meet his fate remember the words are his his hands are broken and in ancient scriptures when you say that his hands are broken it actually refers to the fact that the support that he has of his companions and his brothers and his tribes they are going to be no longer there so i would suggest to this person that Please have a recourse to the uh, tafasir of preferably Ustaz Amin Asr Islahi and Ustaz Jaraved Ahmad Ghamidi of Surah Lahab, and they'll uh, explain this to you that how this is not a word of curse at all. Thank you. Fatma, you can ask your question now. Assalamu alaikum. Um, well, I want to know that uh, is making a badwa for somebody allowed in Islam, like if somebody has hurt you. Can you like give them a badwa? Yes, uh, technically, if someone has hurt you, you can uh, make that. Uh, uh, you can you can retaliate in equal terms. And if someone has done uh, what uh, you cannot actually exact revenge in, in in the same manner. So if you pray to God that uh, let it let it happen that God you do the same thing which I could not have done. This is it is, is perfectly allowed. It is it's an it's an equal retaliation. Uh, except that the prayer uh, that such a prayer should not exceed whatever harm that you have suffered it should be a prayer which should say that uh, the person should be inflicted the same harm as that person had it had afflicted myself thank you rohan you may have your question now all right thank you uh, sir i want to ask that uh, in dua kunut uske andar ek part aata hai jiska mafhoom ye hai ki teri nafarmani karne walon se alag rehte hain aur unhe chhod dete hain i want to ask the meaning of this because uh, like sabke saath to milke rehna chahiye chahe koi kitna bhi gunagar ho to can you please explain that yes the actually the words are nakhla wa natruku mai yaf juruk which means that people who are defined to you people who are openly defined uh, to to god and they defy and dis are disobedient to him then we are, would not be would not be like to part or live in the company of such people so this is a, something of a uh, a stress which needs to be understood it doesn't mean that you have to break relations with them it is like saying that i am not going to live in the company of people for example who are drunkards or people who uh, openly disobey the almighty so one thing is to befriend them and to be to live in their company this is what is being stopped from here and another thing is to have relations with them and especially relations in which you uh, you can maybe make a difference in their lives or uh, if that is not the case then at least uh, wish them by uh, whenever you meet them by saying assalamu alaikum so this is uh, this is something which is not against this verse uh, this uh, this this dua at all all that it says is that you should not i mean befriend or make friends or enjoy the company of such people and start living like what they are doing and you start doing yourselves as well thank you aisha you may ask your question now 
Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. I have heard that when the Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam went for a miraj, he heard the footsteps of Bilal radhiyallahu in the in paradise because Bilal radhiyallahu would always say two raka tahiyatul wudu after making wudu. So between Asr and Maghrib, uh, nafal prayers are forbidden. So can we say that before Maghrib? Uh, this is the first part, and the second part is when I went for Hajj. Uh, I saw uh, people around me; they were saying prayers after the Maghrib prayers, but before Ikama, they were uh, saying two rakat prayer. When I, when I asked them what prayers those were, they couldn't really answer because um, they they weren't English speaking. So uh, what prayer was that? Thank you. First of all, uh, as far as praying between Asr and Maghrib is concerned, it is absolutely fine. Uh, this is a misconception which has arisen that uh, perhaps we cannot pray between Asr and Maghrib. And the reason for this misconception is that uh, in the times of Prophet Muhammad, there were no watches, of course, in which you could tell exact time. And uh, the forbidden part of the prayer uh, of praying is at sunrise and sunset. So the times of sunrise and sunset are the forbidden times of doing sajda or praying. So, uh, because there was a chance that uh, people might pray very close to sunset, so the Prophet at uh, at times uh, marked uh, a remark that well, you should be careful. And there are other narrations in, in this which which clearly say that if you are if you are absolutely sure that it is not sun sunset time and the the sun is still up, uh, there is no harm in praying. So basically, we need to understand that it was a precautionary measure. That was uh, given in those times in the absence of watches, but and people, and it was all the all the chance that people might pray right at the time of uh, sunset without realizing that it's sunset time and this is a time when uh, prostration or namaz or prayer is forbidden. So, uh, if we are clearly sure that it is not sunset time, then any prayer can be offered between uh, between the asr and the time of uh, sunset. And in all probability, the people who were uh, offering the, that prayer, which uh, some people in in uh, in various parts of uh, uh, the world call as the Awabin prayer, uh, they were the ones who were offering those the, those nafils. Although we don't have any proof from the Prophet that he used to offer these prayers, but technically, uh, any prayer which is before sun sunset, the time of sunset, can be offered, and uh, of course, they would be offering uh, that prayer. Uh, regarding your question on uh, on Miraj uh, uh, and uh, and and the details which are of course uh, presented in this uh, during this journey, uh, they are these details are mostly in Hadith literature as you would be knowing. And uh, if you have heard in detail some of the views that uh, we have expressed or the Farai school has expressed on uh, the on regarding Miraj, you would be familiar with the fact that this was basically a spiritual journey. It was uh, it was something that took place in a dream, and the Quran, the Quran itself calls it a dream. So whatever happened in that dream was of symbolic in nature. Uh, it was symbolism, and that symbolism had something to communicate. But then, of course, that would need some more time to clarify. And I would refer you to some of the lectures and talks that uh, our moderators might refer you to, in which it has been shown that this uh, mirage or the uh, ascension was basically a spiritual journey. In which whatever he was shown uh, had a symbolical symbolic uh, significance. Just as when we see things in in a dream, they have they are symbolic and they are not to be taken literally. So the only difference between our dreams and the dreams of prophets of God is that for prof the, the prophets of God's uh, of God they are shown true dreams, and for them dreams are actually a means of instruction and education. Thank you, Doctor Swayal. You may have your question now. Uh, Doctor Salim, assalamualaikum. Uh, right. Once again, thank thank you for your uh, uh, brilliant talk today. My question is about uh, today is about uh, eternal damnation, uh, the punishment of being put into hell for all eternity of time, uh, and uh, and a question about it. Now uh, I'm aware that the traditional school of majority of Muslim scholars, uh, when they talk about eternal damnation, they take it literally that it is eternal damnation for the people who deserve to be eternally damned but i know two caveats and i know that they are, they are in minority one is from i think from imam tamia and his uh, student imam imam jazavi who mentions that the word abada used in these ayats is metaphorical 
and uh, actually it's not eternal punishment for any group of people. And to my knowledge, the second minority view in this is for high school, and I've heard you talk, and Gandhi sort of talk about it, Surah Hud, in which there are some ayats which say that uh, Allah can, uh, you know, if he wants, uh, hell might not be for eternity, where heaven is for eternity. So barring these two caveats, which are in the minority view, which groups of people do you think would be eternally damned? And before you answer that question, um, can you explain to me the definition of three words, mushrik, kafir, and non-believer, sorry, four words, mushrik, kafir, non-believer, and non-Muslim. Can you define those first four words for me, please, before you uh, tell me the groups that would be eternally damned in hell? So, uh, mushrik is a person who adopts idolatry or shirk as religion uh, by knowing that he is doing shirk. So, for example, uh, uh, you cannot call a Christian a mushrik because he, he or she does, would say that, well, I'm a monotheist and I believe in one God. And uh, if you think that I'm a, uh, I'm a mushrik, then uh, this you are, uh, have wrongly understood. So it's basically one's own view of uh, uh, of the religion that he or she would adopt regarding uh, multiple or singular gods that would account for. So the idolaters of Arabia, they they would actually adopt um, multiple gods and they, will, they would say that, yes, we believe in several gods. So in other words, the person who himself admits to believe in several gods is, a one, is the one who is called a mushrik. And a person who might be, I mean, uh, uh, someone who... To, uh, to us, apparently, does believe in more than one God, but he himself calls himself to be a monotheist. Will never be called a mushrik, or should not be called a mushrik. And this is the this is the lesson which Quran has taught us by not calling at a single instance in the Quran, and uh, not a single instance will you can can we quote in which the people of the book are called mushrik because they themselves liked to be called monotheists or they thought that they are monotheists. And the Quran respected their view in, spe in spite of the fact they said that this is a blatant form of uh, polytheism. Uh, so this is how we would uh, say uh, uh, mushrik is. So mushrik means a person who willfully adopts polytheism as uh, as uh, as religion. Uh, as far as uh, disbelief, uh, as a kafir is concerned, well, a kafir is a person which uh, is a person who intentionally denies the basic truths. Uh, like for example, who intentionally denies uh, the the accountability in the hereafter, who intentionally denies God in any way or who intentionally denies the fact that there is going to be any hereafter or who, who in, uh, uh, denies a messenger of God. So any person who intentionally out of, I mean, deliberate, willful intention denies something, that person is called a kafir. So, uh, and the other two I think you asked about was uh, non-Muslim. So non-Muslim is just a plain word which just refers to an entity or a person who is not a Muslim, whatever he be. And what was the fourth term that you asked? Non-believer. So non-believer also is traditionally used, uh, uh, I mean, synonymously as a, as a person who is non-Muslim. So the word non-Muslim and non-believer, they are not religious terms. They are terms that we have coined and uh, generally they are used synonymously. But of course, because of the fact that we have coined them, uh, so it also depends on the context. But the first two terms are terms of the Quran. And therefore, I can, uh, regarding them, I can define clearly that what a mushrik and a kafir is. And then, regarding your question that who are the people who are, who are worthy of eternal damnation, the Quran has actually spelled this out at a number of places. And uh, uh, I, I respectfully disagree with, uh, with Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and, uh, uh, and, and his student uh, when they say that Abada is used for uh, as, a, as, a, as a metaphor or, or something of a symbolic in uh, some a symbol in nature because you see at a number of occasions the words used by the Quran are not just Abada it says Khalidina Fiha Abada uh, which needs which leaves no room to interpret the fact that they are uh, I mean not uh, going to be eternally damned a Khalidina uh, is something which which says Khalid means something which is eternal. Abada is, is something which further emphasizes and tells, well, this eternity itself is going to be eternal, so to speak. So an eternity which is eternal, uh, such, is the, uh, such is the emphasis. Now, what Ramadi Sahib has actually said, he is not uh, refuting in any way this eternal damnation. 
what he is saying is that the, the way there are certain verses which in surah hud the way they are mentioned uh, this could show that there could be a time in which hell would cease to exist and ma damat is samawat wal ard the way that they, they are they are ex expressed in the in the quran uh, this would mean that the, the, the people who would be eternally damned one day they might just they just become they just finish off and hell hell just ceases to exist and uh, when when this is said it would just mean that they just i mean they they are gone they are kaput so that's that's a third uh, i would say uh, third uh, interpretation which is different from uh, the traditional interpretation and also different from the ibn taymiyah's interpretation and as far as eternal damnation is concerned the the crimes which make uh, a person eligible for eternal damnation if you if you just pick out all these verses which say khalidina fiha abada khalidina fiha abada you'll find them that they are mostly uh, it is mostly arrogance which makes a person deny a certain truth which includes a messenger of god so uh, this is how you'll find uh, and and you can do this exercise yourself that just pick out the words khalidina fiha abada when where, where both of these are mentioned and you'll see that most of the people or most of the criminals which are under discussion who deserve this punishment are ones who have intentionally out of arrogance uh, in spite of being convinced that there is something uh, that they are facing is the truth they outrightly denied it okay um as always obviously when you're talking to someone the terminology and the words you use the syntax and the syllables is so important because if you're not talking about the same thing it always causes controversies and disruptions so the four words that i ask you to clarify in the beginning are the four common words that i use when these eternal damnation or punishment is uh, is is discussed so if you talk to a non muslim i mean the word non muslim at the moment we consider it or most people will consider it as someone who's not under the muhammadian law but from the definition of muslim from the farai school and from the quran a muslim can easily be a jew or a christian they are defined as muslims is that would my understanding be correct so when yes, we say would... non when we say no. non muslims will go to hell or you know if you if you face a an angry christian his most common argument would be oh you guys believe that non muslims will go to hell is actually not true because we are not saying non muslims will go to hell because we are defining muslims as all monotheistic uh followers would my understanding be correct yes absolutely correct okay well that's fine so that's clarified now which then brings me to the first two words again kafir and uh, and and an idolater i is it mushrik and a kaf so mushrik is very clear a person who believes in multiple de deities but a kafir is would you say a kafir is a person who then in who could be a mushrik but also denies the basic tenets that are related to god is that what you meant by a kafir yes you see uh, the the element of intentional denial creeps into the word disbeliever the word kafir or the word kafir actually means to to hide something and to to uh, engulf something with a cover that's the root meaning but kafir means someone who who intentionally denies the truth and all mushriks are kafirs but not all kafirs are mushriks so this is uh, another thing that you might need to know but the, what what the important part is that uh, it we just cannot regard any non muslim to be a kafir uh summarily and dismiss him by saying that but whatever is mentioned regarding non muslims in the quran is the same as what is mentioned regarding kafirs the word kafir uh, in 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 many cases in most cases i would say uh, wherever the punishment is mentioned for them is is referring to a particular category of uh, non muslims uh, of the times of the prophet muhammad only only who had deliberately denied and therefore had become liable to punishment and the way, and the fact that their deliberate denial is something uh, that was uh, diagnosed again is something which i have been explaining a number of times that this was again not the job of the prophet himself it was the almighty who would communicate the fact that well now you have done enough now the people against you are 
deliberately denying. There is no, there is no room left for any improvement, and they are now deliberately denying because you see, deliberate denial is something which is which rests in the heart. I mean, it's like something which is in your intention. You just cannot judge a person from outside whether he is deliberately denying or not. So, in the times of prophets of God, deliberate denial was something which could be diagnosed not even by prophets but by the Almighty, and because the institution of Wahi was there, so through Wahi. The Almighty would communicate to his prophets that now you have done enough. Now the person or the people in front of you are guilty of deliberate denial. So that is why they became uh, guilty. I mean, uh, liable to certain punishments. Later on, once prophets of God have left us, I mean, after the Prophet Muhammad, he was the last of those prophets. Today also, there could be people around us who could be kafirs, which means that they are intentionally denying. But we have no means to pinpoint them because in the times of Prophet Muhammad and the, and the previous prophets, it was God who was pinpointing them and bringing this information in the knowledge of the prophets, because this is something which only God can pinpoint and know. Today, in the absence of any such communication with God, in spite of the fact that there could be non-Muslims today who would be deliberately denying and guilty of the fact, but we have no means of knowing them. And secondly, we, do, we don't have a prophet of God to deliver the truth to them in such a manner that if they deny it, then they'll become labeled as kafir. So you to be a kafir, you have to have two things, the presence of a messenger of God, and then in spite of his presence and uh, communication of the truth, they end up deliberately denying the, that prophet. So these two things are not available in the post-prophetic period. So therefore today, even if people are deliberately denying, we just cannot pinpoint them because we have no means to know who they are. All we know is that uh, there, are, there are just two categories, Muslims or non-Muslims. And for all non-Muslims, uh, uh, we just cannot uh, use the term of kafir for them. This would be outright uh, misunderstanding the Quran. Mr. Khwaja, you can go first. <coughs> yeah, I have a brief question. Uh, Daksab, I know you, uh, Ramdi Saab team was working on Hadith, uh, the collection of Hadith. Uh, is it done already or well, how will it be available? Will it be on the website or it will be available in the book form? Well, it's available on the website and also published in, in the journals every month, but it will take a long time to be completed. I think we have, we have, we have just done about maybe 25 to 30% of the work in about five years and it would need another 10 to 15 years, inshallah, if, uh, if God permits us <coughs> to complete and perhaps uh, then it will be started uh, to get printed in, in, in book form. But uh, the, 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 the work which has been done, I think uh, at least 60% of the work that has been done is already published in, in various installments in the journals. Uh, is it in Ishraq or? It's, it's in Ishraq and in, in Renaissance, uh, both of these journals. Thank you, Shiraz Ahmed. You may have your question now. Uh, Suhail Sahib earlier on asked a question about the four terms uh, and I'm going to focus on the two terms, right? One is Kafir, one is Mushrik. <coughs> Quran even declared, uh, not declared, but called even Muslims Kafir, you know, after the second battle that they had, that on that day, they were more close to Kafir as compared to I Iman, right? Uh, when they didn't listen to the Prophet properly. So it's my understanding about the term that Kafir is about swaying away from the message. Now, whether you are doing it intentionally or inten unintentionally, is something that God is going to judge on uh, Judgment Day. But you can be a Muslim, a proclaiming Muslim, but in the sight of God, you can be kafir based upon your actions. So, who is truly a kafir and who is not? Only God can, you know, uh, suggest that. So that's. Uh, is this understanding correct? That kafir well, is defined by your actions along with your intentions, which only God can know. I get your point. You see, there, you have to make a distinction between the verb kafara and the adjective kafir. So the verse that you are referring to is hum yawmaizin lil kufr. Uh, they were close to kufr on that day. So to be close to kufr is to say that someone is close to disbelief. Uh, in spite of being a believer, someone can be close to disbelief. Like, for example, if I'm a believer and I go to a saint's grave and start prostrating before him, uh, I would be doing something kufr. But that act is not going to make me a kafir. So there is a very fine line which Imam Farahi has actually pointed out here, and I need some elaboration, which inshallah I might do. Uh, but I'll try to explain it very briefly. 
that the verb kafara when it is when it occurs is entirely a different thing to what the word kafir which is an adjective which is a ismul fail so uh, kafara means an instance of kufr which can even emanate from a believer and kafir is someone who is someone who has adopted disbelief as as a, as a as as a belief i would say disbelief as a belief so uh, there is this small distinction and if you can go through the quran you'll make this distinction that even the people of the book are called uh, kafar i mean the word kafar is used for them uh, and yep. instance similarly yep. for mushrik but you'll find that the word whenever the word kafir is used which is like an adjective it is only used when uh, that deliberate denial is is taken upon one self uh as as something which one knows clearly so i would suggest that you study the quran with, and underline the words wherever it occurs as a verb and wherever it occurs as a as a noun or an adjective so that that is how the distinction is made but of course there are some other details which we can discuss maybe tomorrow or in a, one of the sure. coming sessions sure. now should i be about the word mushrik thank thank you for for elaboration on that about the word uh, mushrik right uh, it's my understanding uh, which can be totally wrong that's why i'm talk, uh, asking you that even in the sense where a certain community considers more than one god to be part of the system even the mushrik in makkah went like that they they believed in one god allah who is the creator of the heavens and the earth who is the sustainer everything and all that along with that they considered certain personalities like angels who are close enough to god that no matter what our deeds are if we please these certain people they will ending up doing shifarish in front of allah subhanahu wa taala and get the job done for us so in that certain true sense of let's say hinduism where you have vishnu or you have uh, you know brahma or you have other gods uh, uh, like so they don't believe that there are three different gods who are running the show of this universe as per quran quran is well explicit they believed in one true god like you and i do uh, uh, theoretically speaking but in their practical day to day activities they relied on create creations of that god which they even labeled as daughters or whatever whom they think can get the job done for us we muslims today hold a large group of us similar beliefs so isn't the word mushrik in quran used as an identification because they used to identify themselves as such whereas the polytheism as far as conceptual polytheism is concerned does not require us to believe in multiple almighties there is only one almighty even for mushrik in makkah but to act in our day to day life and rely on other creatures that they can get the job done forcefully or through god no matter what our actions are is uh, do, do you disagree with I, this i understand your view but you see this is not the view of the quran the quran actually has cited these mushrikun at several instances in which they say that we worship other gods so that they bring us closer to you so the 360 365 idols which were placed in the holy kaaba uh they were each of them were worshiped uh, separately and the quran has actually named them as waddam waswa and yahus uh, these are the names of some of the deities which they they worshiped separately yes they they thought that god was the supreme god the only thing is that they thought that allah is the supreme god but the rest are semi or demi gods and they used to give they, they used to worship them the way uh, i mean they used to worship god so and this is entirely different from the uh, uh, hindu concept because in hinduism we have the trimurti in which the in which yeah. brahma vishnu and krishna they are the three gods and hinduism itself started off with the uh, with the creed of monotheism you will not find any uh, multiple gods it, it was only in later scriptures that they crept in otherwise as far as the um, idolaters or the mushrikun of the of the of arabia are, are concerned uh, i i would suggest you if you could look up uh, ustaz amin hasan islahi's haqeeqat e shirk wa tawhid is a book that he wrote and in, in which he has list and listed the forms of their shirk that they did and they willingly said that yes we we obey, we worship the jinn so you'll find a verse in the quran in which it, it says ya budun al jinn they used to worship the jinn they used to worship uh, dot, daughters of uh, angels as daughters of god they used to worship their saints so he has made a list of all those verses in which the types of the polytheism that they uh were guilty of uh, is enumerated and that is why the quran has actually given them the title of al mushrikun which it never gave the people of the book in spite of the fact that we know that they believed jesus to be the son of god so the title of al mushrikun was only given to them because they deliberately willfully and intentionally thought that they are more than one god they thought that allah is the supreme god 
but then the rest are his uh, subservient to him but they do serve a certain purpose thank you dr shahzad that's the end of the questions for today okay well please